Welcome to Martini Time. It's been a beautiful day here in Blackstone, Virginia, the center of the world. But then we're all the center of the world. We are. Just like a computer is the center of the internet, each one of us is the center of the cosmos. It's like you zoom, you, you Google, Google down to where you are and then you, right here I am, and then you zoom out all the way past Virginia, past the, go past the earth, all the way in to infinity. Or you zoom in and you're standing there in the Google map and the zooms right to you and then it keeps going inside. And then it goes into the uh, organs and the cells and the suck structure of the cells and it keeps zooming in to infinity. And there you are, right in the middle. The middle point of the whole cosmos. Zero. Form going positive, uh, increasing form going that way, decreasing form going that way. To infinity and beyond. And there you are, in right smack in the middle as zero. Perfect balance perfect balance, you see. Each one of us is the center of the universe reflecting the whole cosmos. This is the, this is the uh, paradigm or the, or the mythic image of Buddhism in, and, uh, in yoga. It's called Indra's Net. And it, for, and it looks at the world, the cosmos, as a vast net with intersecting at, at where each line intersects is a crystal pearl like a dew drop that reflects everything else and everything is reflected back in it. You don't like when you put two mirrors together. So everything is interrelated. Everything rises together. We think in our Western uh, paradigm, materialism, we think in terms of lines, it's cause and effect. And this is, works very well when you are talking about a machine. I got a lawnmower and it's starting to go wah, wah. So there's a cause to it. So I can find the cause, why it's not running steady. I know there's a cause to it. It's not magic. It doesn't have a personal vendetta against me to not run. <laughs> there is a cause, and it's a single cause usually, sometimes a multiple cause. We've been watching uh, Paradise, uh, Murder in Paradise, British mystery, and uh, we've, it's already around. But they will, they will, uh, just to trick you, they will uh, the, to trick the detective. There will be uh, two suspects will pair up to do a murder that not one could do. So you think there was one single cause, but there was two, and they worked the murder so that you, so that there was no no way that one person could do it. But anyway, I digress. So what we're looking at here is an interconnected universe where everything rises together. In Buddhism it's called dependent origination. Everything is dependent upon everything. And if you look at any one thing, it's like snow. There's no single cause for snow. It's a set of conditions. And each one of those conditions has conditions. And each one of those conditions has conditions. And each one of those conditions has conditions. Where can you stop? It's con everything is rising together, you see. But we tend to look at things linearly. The cause is in the past, and, the co and I'm the effect of the cause. I'm sick, so there's a cause. It's like the car broke down, so you go to the doctor and he looks for the cause. He doesn't see the whole system. He doesn't see your whole life. He doesn't see your, your, your hopes, your dreams. He doesn't see your whole context. He's looking for a single cause, and um, then he'll give you a pill for it. But then that pill has causes, <laughs> and so we go, you see. But anyway, uh, the, I guess this just came up when I was saying, so anyway, last night we had a uh, dinner at a friend's house, and uh, oh, beautiful pond in the back, and uh, hummingbirds flocking around like a, like a hornet hive, you know, just coming around feeding, and the uh, setting sun and the dusk, and uh, no mosquitoes, 
one big moth. That was very nice, very peaceful. And a friend I met there uh, got to strike uh, uh, another uh, friend of the host uh, travels a lot and he and he loves going Buddhism and he collects he said he collected all these Buddhist statues and he loves these Buddhist temples and and uh, um, anyway we just well, of course we had a great conversation because you know I got Buddhas I got <laughs> I got Buddhas all over the place here uh, so we had a great conversation and um, you know, we were talking about, uh, among many things, about the difference between the uh, Buddhist temple in Asia, these temples, are great, uh, and, and right here in Virginia, go to Yogaville on the James River between Charlottesville and Farmville, there is a uh, temple called the Lotus that has been uh, almost levitated from India, from Swami Satchananda and Integral Yoga. So when you go into a temple, there's an interior, there's a stillness. You can almost cut it with a knife, you know. And it's so different from our churches. Our churches are about uh, relationships and uh, uh, membership and uh, um, the, uh, uh, about, about uh, being in a group. Uh, there's very little stillness in a, in a, in a uh, Christian service. If you want to go to the Quakers, but there's, uh, everything is filled in, you see. It's scheduled, there's a program. You go to the, uh, like a Presbyterian church and you got the program, it's like a play, and you read the program, and it's all programmed out, you see. And, uh, you know, and so, uh, uh, and then Catholic church is heavy with ritual. It's ritual heavy with ritual and yet you go to a Buddhist temple and there's nothing there <laughs> except this except this uh, giant Buddha they have huge in Asia have you see if the globe tracker go to Discovery Channel these Buddhas are as big as a, a five-story building they're huge I wish I could see one but imagine this three stories high Imagine that. What is that? It's it's uh, it's awesome, and that's a great word. Awesome, awesome. We go to the Grand Canyon and feel oh. We go to the Grand Canyon. We see the. I remember going to New York, and if you went to the Twin Towers, oh, you see. Uh, we we our awesome is in what we build. Um, we also have awesome in uh, movies like Avatar. <gasps> awesome, but that's only a one-time awesome. After you've seen it, you're not awed anymore. See, you wait till the next one. You know, and the sequels never awe you because you've seen everything. So it's got to be a new technological invention to get the <gasps> awesome. You see, so this awesome, this awe, you see, is missing from our life. Everything is uh, ritualized. But you go to a Buddhist temple, or you go to Yogaville, and there's you just sit. There's nothing there. You just go there, and you sit, and you and you leave your shoes at the door. You leave the world at the door. So you go into an uncharted, unprogrammed space, interior space. It's like with the Google Map. You go out to space. Or you zoom in, keep going till you get to space. Either way, you got space. Either way, you got a bookend of emptiness. And in between, with zero, with you in the middle, right? You're zero in the middle. Zoom in to space, zoom out to space. Bookended by space, by emptiness, you see. And just all this busyness in between. All this form. So our culture is form attached, form identified. This has been the Western, the miracle of the Western European Western civilization since the Enlightenment. It figured out how to discover the laws of form 
and make stuff and predict the future. You don't need God if you can predict the future with science. So science is all about controlling the future. You got an air conditioner, you're controlling, you're gonna, you know that you're gonna be able to control the temperature in the future. So when you come home, your house is comfortable. You see, so that's controlling the future. That's controlling your environment, controlling conditions, you see. You live in a jungle, conditions just rise, you see. But you live in a mechanized world like ours, conditions are controlled. So we don't realize how controlled we are. That's why people like to go uh, to India and Asia. It's not controlled. I mean, traffic goes blah, 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 everywhere. And it freaks us out. I, I'm, I went to India once, and it was in to Ganesh Puri, to Swami Muktananda's ashram, 1980. Little town, 50 miles from Bombay, Mumbai. Went to a bank to get, to get my money changed. And it was a long counter, and they had seven clerks there. So I went to one end, and I gave them my, my, my American money, and they started, and they had to pass the transaction all the way down to seven clerks, and they each got to stamp something. And then I, got to the, then I went down the other end, and I got my Indian money. And it took off the thing. See? So disorganized. So the other, man, one computer would fix this place. Yeah, but it would put them all out of work. But anyway, I digress again. But the point is, it's just not efficient. It's just to let conditions to rise, you see. So these other cultures let conditions rise without trying to control them. But our culture is all about control. Control conditions. And of course then, we, we're very intent on fixing conditions when, they, when there is the slightest thing that's out of control. I remember back when I used to read, uh, when I was with the Courier Record, and uh, once a week I would uh, look in the archives to write a from the, from the record column, something about the past, a, a quote from the past, because they had all the newspapers of the Courier Record all the way back to the 20s, even First World War. And I'd look through these old newspapers, and I would read that uh, so-and-so uh, was it was died from carbon monoxide poisoning by sitting in his Model T with the windows shut. Ford was never sued. That was just conditions. What do you do? We'll open the window. <laughs> right? You don't sue Ford Motor Company. Conditions are the Ford that the conditions of the Ford was that it, the gas leaked up through the floor, and it would kill you. Those were the conditions. So you just worked with the conditions that were given. You see. But see how things have changed? Uh, we don't work with the condition. We hate the conditions that are given. We reject the conditions that are given. We don't accept them. No. We want to manufacture conditions to give us perfect comfort. You see. Perfect air conditioner. Oh, it's too cold, too hot. Perfect air conditioner, perfect sofa, perfect rugs, perfect lighting, perfect order, you see. Controlling conditions. You see, that's, that's what we live in. And uh, we think this is the way the world should be. But the world really isn't like that. This is, this is a overlay. This is a, uh, uh, it's like a, it's like a, uh, uh, you used to remember getting these when you used to get paper books <laughs> and it would have a, a ground map of terrain and then you would overlay plastic overlays and you could keep laying plastic overlays, you know. Well, the ground rock of terrain is dependent origination. Everything is arising together, you see. But we overlay, we overlay this film of control, that we can uh, control conditions and control the future and make life perpetually perfect. 
make life permanent, you see. Make life permanently. Make me permanently perfect. Well, maybe not perfect, but permanently comfortable. That's, that's the mantra. That's the, imper that's the law of our Western culture. Make me permanently comfortable. Even when I'm dying, I want to be comfortable. So just keep me full of morphine. I want to be comfortable. And all the advertisings, comfort. It won't, this will make you comfortable. The search for comfort. We should have in our Declaration of Independence the pursuit of comfort. <laughs> That's what we pursue here. And if anything disturbs it, like comfort is based on oil, so if anything disturbs our source of oil, we get very uncomfortable. <laughs> we'll go to war to keep from being uncomfortable. We don't like being uncomfortable. We don't like conditions that rise. We want to stamp them down, you see. So I've been uh, uh, talking lately. Uh, last couple of days I've been hung up, hung up on an idea I've been compulsing. <laughs> I've been compulsing on the idea of compulsion. Investigating it, sniffing it, following it, seeing it in my own life. And uh, the different ways of understanding compulsion, but one of them I've been thinking about is that it's ritual. So compulsion is a ritual. And a ritual is some behavior that you repeat. Like this Facebook Live. This is now a ritual. However, it's a ritual that is conscious. So I make this is a very conscious ritual. I'm not just reading a report. I'm not just reading something. See, I'm very conscious, and yet at the same time, I'm surrendering to conditions. It's not planned. It's not planned, you see. So I'm, I'm trusting that conditions will rise that won't embarrass me. <laughs> you see. So I am this, but it's a ritual in the sense that I do this every day around close to five o'clock. And it's almost a compulsion in that I, I don't have to do it, but there's an urge to do it, even though I don't know what I'm going to say. So this, um, as I try to connect the dots here, we're looking at a way of life that surrenders to conditions, yet at the same time, you can do things to be more comfortable. But you see, the, the, uh, uh, the ground of the book, looking back at that map, the ground of the terrain, that would be the ground, the rivers, the hills, the ground, the earth. That's conditional, that's rising, you see. That's conditional, that's dependent origination, that's the ground. But then we overlay the strategies and the rituals, you see. So comfort becomes ritualized. We, whatever we do, whatever we do, this comfort becomes a ritual. You see, and so then that these rituals then become uh, interlaid and woven into a way of life that is all ritualized, and it's totally unconscious. Consciousness is not ritualized. Consciousness is absolutely free. It's awareness. You know, you know it's creative. You know. Creative consciousness is awareness, you see. And that's not ritualized, because a ritualized is a behavior that is repeated for a secret reason. You know, I guess if you look at, um, well, let me see. All right, let's go take a church. All right, let's, Sunday I was at Mount Nebo. Now, Mount Nebo, and they had communion. Now, all the Protestant churches have communion. And it's a ritual. 
and everybody has different reasons or meanings for it. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's not a conscious meal like we had last night at my friend's house with this delicious chicken and corn on the cob and some Mexican dish that was absolutely fabulous and uh, margaritas. Now that was a conscious meal. That was, I, <laughs> I was so there for that meal, you see. But then you take the ritual of the Last Supper. You know, you got it's kind of, everybody's just watching, you know, and you eat that, and you think, and you, and it's very solemn, you know. It's like you're eating a dead body. It's like you're eating a corpse, you know. It's there's no joy in that ritual. There's no consciousness. There's no liberation. There's no dance. There's no taste. You see. So the ritual is pretty much a repetitious ritual for membership in the church. It's what the church does. It's kind of like the the uh, uh, the 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 cent Catholic Church. The whole Catholic ceremony is built around the mass. The Protestantism is uh, not so much. You see. It's kind of like, well, we remember, we, we take this in remembrance of Jesus, you see. It's a remembrance, you know. But there's no life in it. In fact, most of the wafers, not, most of them don't even have living bread. It's like wafers. And they don't even have wine, they have grape juice, you see. So it gets to be totally plastic, just a blind ritual. So I'm talking about the uh, 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 conscious ritual. So even the the uh, the communion in the church is kind of like a compulsion. You just have to do it. You do it. There's nothing wrong with it. I'm just saying that uh, we're kind of like looking at a uh, uh, contrast here uh, between a ritualized life uh, to a, li a living life that is conscious and aware. So the, the um, getting back to the Buddhist temple as we try to bring this to a close here. The Buddhist temple, the temple, is, an, is to enter into an interior place of stillness that you leave the world of ritual and thinking outside. Now thinking is ritualized. Have you ever noticed that we think in ritual patterns? That we think in compulsive feedback loops? If you could look at your thinking as if you were watching it, you would see patterns. There is just patterns of thought. And we identify with these patterns. We think that's me. And these patterns of thought have feelings and emotions fear, desire, and the condition and the, condi and the world around us will stimulate our, our interior rituals. And we have no idea that we're trapped by an unconscious rit Thought is unconscious. We, see, we think thinking is conscious. So thoughts are interior rituals. You have exterior rituals and you have interior rituals. But they're all unconscious. Blind repetition is unconscious. Consciousness is not repetitive because consciousness is creative. Creativity is not re plagiarizing the past. Creativity is new. So life is new. So if you look at the Indra's net and everything is interdependent, Everything is conditionally conditioned upon all other conditions, conditions upon conditions, and all is rising together. So the world we see around us is rising up into the moment fresh because all these conditions are interreacting like weather to create a new present moment. So this present moment right now is and still the present moment. So this present moment is like a dynamic present moment. It's not static. 
If it was static, it would be you stopped, you see. <laughs> but it's dynamic. So the present moment is always moving and it's always new. It's always new because all of these conditions, like weather, are interreacting and creating new present moment, you see. So it's always new, you see. So the East and the Buddha and these, this paradigm of the East is more of a surrender to the conditions and getting in harmony with the new conditions. Whereas our paradigm is control the conditions so they are ritualized into traffic patterns. They're ritualized into nine to five. They're ritualized into assembly lines. They're ritualized into church services. They're ritualized exteriorly and they're ritualized interiorly because we think in repetitive patterns. But within all that conditioning, there is a Buddhist temple inside that longs to be free from conditioning. And when that freedom happens, something, a miracle happens. You find yourself being happy for no reason. You find yourself being at peace for no reason because when that awakening happens, when the mind that is not attached to form and conditions awakens, you are not conditioned by conditions. You are conditions. It's like in a river. You either swim against it or you flow with it. So life is a flowing of interdependent conditions. So the surrender to conditions doesn't mean you become a passive victim. No, it means that you balance with conditions. So you're always zero. You're always zero. If you try to get out of zero, you're going to add something and that's going to create a negative because you're always at zero. So can surrender to conditions is surrendering to your life, you see. And that creates a whole different paradigm, a whole different way of being in reality, a whole different way of being. And there are different laws to that way of being. When we identify with form, there are the laws of form, and that's the laws of science, you see. Cause and effect, karma. But when we, when we uh, free ourselves from attachment to form, which begins freeing ourselves from the attachment to thinking. We can't be free from attachment to form until we're free from attachment to thinking. And you can't be free from attachment to thinking unless you go to a temple, maybe in your own bedroom, maybe a meditation chair, maybe a little zafu, Maybe a little space where you leave your shoes at the back, at the outside and you go in and you sit in the silence of the bookends. Remember, you're at zero. Zoom in all the way to silence and stillness. Zoom out all the way to space and stillness, you see. So this space and stillness surrounds us. So when you go to a meditation, either in the temple or in your bedroom, or in a meditation room, you leave the world of conditioning, you leave the world of form at the door, and then you sit, and then you leave your form, the, the attachment to thinking by just letting it go, and just taking the vow to sit, and not move, and you let the thoughts go. You don't identify with them, they're like geese. You don't go with them to the south, you just let them go, you see. So that detaches us from the ritual thinking. And with that detachment, the mind that is not attached to form begins to arise and you discover that you are awake and aware and you are creative and you're full of joy. And whatever you want to do, you can do with passion and enthusiasm because you're free from time. 
you're free from conditions because now you create conditions. You create the world you're in because you are in harmony with the ground of the world. You're not creating a world that isn't in harmony, you're creating a world that's in harmony with the river of life, you see, instead of creating a world that's out of harmony with it, which is the one we live in now. So thanks for dropping in.